today is Heritage Night, and um, I just thought, you know, it'd be really cool to have someone with some heritage to come and preach. And Pastor Todd, Timu, and I have been friends for 20 years and you know, kind of partners in ministry. And um, uh, the one thing I, 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 I'm just disappointed with Todd is that his team beat Canada last night, you know, in, in women's rugby. Uh, New Zealand won, but uh, we got the silver medal. Um, at least France lost. That's, that's what's good. So <laughs> anyway, uh, so I want to just invite Pastor Todd to come, and he's going to share tonight. Would you give, give him a, a new life welcome as, as he comes up? And uh, shares he loves Jesus and and that's and we, he's a friend a new life friend of mine and just um, thank you for coming brother and preaching the word Thank you, Mike. hello everybody this being the heritage uh, theme for today I'm excited to represent the Polynesian people in Lloyd Minster all three of us I think there's one from Samoa, then one from Fiji, and myself from the Cook Islands. So um, it, it's great to be here with you. It's good to be part of this beautiful outdoor service. Isn't God good? He is good. God is good. And we want to celebrate that here, and we have that opportunity for us to open the Word of God. You know, thank you, worship team. That was beautiful. And now that your heart has been marinated and your heart is tenderized, are you ready to hear the word? Yes. And let's do it. Let's pray. We love you, Father. We thank you for our time together here this afternoon. You're so good to us. What can we offer back to you but to say we love you? We love you, God. Thank you for your goodness. And now as we open your word, <clears throat> your word tells us that the entrance of your word gave us light. Oh, how we need that, especially in this time on our culture. That, that rings so true and special to us that the entrance of your word, because it seems like, Father, that we have lost our way in this culture. May your spirit provide wisdom that we may apply our hearts to what you have for us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. It was in 1976, a missionary came to the Pacific Islands, all the way from Watasco in Alberta. Back in 19... Anyways. Many of you were not born yet anyway. So. Back in 1976, I remember the time when he came to preach under whole bunch of coconut trees close to the beach. And he said, and he challenged us, he was this boy I've never heard the gospel preach and explain to me. I grew up in a religious home. But I was sitting there, and I remember the last thing he said after he sat down, here's what he said. The most critical decision that you can ever make in your life is whether or not you are reconciled to the God who loves you. And I was sitting there, this island boy, I felt the tug of the Holy Spirit. I got up and walked up and asked, him, can you show me how to be reconciled to this God that you were talking about? He talks about the death of Christ. He talks about the burial of Jesus Christ. He talks about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the heartbeat of the church. You take that away, we have no message. And that 
turned my inside out when I heard that message for the very first time. I walked up in 1976. I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. And what a journey that was. But I want to talk about this heartbeat of the church. Jesus died for the sins of this world. Jesus was buried and suffered the maternity that we should have suffered. And was raised from the dead by the power of God to display the fact that death has been swallowed up in victory. Where all death is your victory? Where all death is your sting? But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brother and sisters, listen to this. I think this is never a relevant time to preach this one phrase to us here today, especially in what's going on in our culture today. He said this, therefore, my brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Stand firm. Preach the word. But preach the word in love. I want to share a few verses from Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, and I'm just going to go through that and then make some comments. Paul says that in chapter 2, verse 1, he said, As for you, Ephesians, you were dead. He didn't say that you were bad. He said you were dead. That is the beginning of your story, Ephesians. That's the beginning of my story that I understand I was dead. I wasn't bad. He went on to say, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. That is what sin and transgressions does. They make you dead. And in verse 2, in which you used to live when you followed, oh, this is powerful, when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. In other words, here's what he's saying to the Ephesians. Listen, look back. At one time, you allowed the influence and attitude and preferences of your society to dictate how you live your life. They were in a cultural bondage, embracing the values and expressing the vices of their society. If you have been following what's going on in our country and in our world today, we are living in a time of unprecedented cultural changes like we have never seen before. Our culture is becoming even more so at enmity with Christianity. In fact, even enmity with Christ. I have to turn my TV off while watching the opening ceremony of the Summer Olympic Games in Paris. Many of you have seen it. The mockery, the blasphemy, the demonic, the desecration of God's name. We can no longer sit back. You see what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. My brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. This is the time. We must stay in the word as Christians. And we must allow it to be the lenses to view the world. Just understand that. Just understand that. Satan and the demonic realm and the prince of the power of the air is at work furiously to destroy what we have always known and to create a new world order. Paul went on. All of us also in verse 3, all of us who lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following its desires and thoughts, like the rest we were by nature deserve of wrath. 
He said, remember back the time when you allowed the powerful influences of society's attitudes, the habits, and the preferences to determine your, to determine your behavior? You were in a hopeless situation, nothing coming your way, but a terrible encounter with a holy and righteous God. That is what sin did and does. Makes us physically and spiritually dead with no chance of having a relationship with the holy God. We have to be very clear about that before the following verses because good news is coming, ladies and gentlemen. You have heard in the last three verses, we're dead because of sin. But listen to verse 4, but, that's a good but. Bad news, here's the good news. But, amen to that, amen to the but. Some of you don't, I don't know, you bunch of Baptists into the... But because of his great love for, for us, God, who is rich in mercy. Remember the beginning of your story, you were dead. But because of his great love for us, God, oh, I love that. Who is rich in mercy, this is powerful. God saw you as dead in your sins and objects of his wrath. And he said, listen, I'm covering you with my love. I'm covering you with my mercy. And because of his love and mercy, look at verse 5. Oh, this is glorious. Look at verse 5. What did he do? He said, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive. He did not make us better. He made us alive. He did not improve us. He made us alive. He did not make us members of a church. He made us alive. He made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. Yeah, you can clap. It's okay to clap. Verse 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourself. It is the gift of God. The gift of God. Don't you ever forget that. Undeserved. We were dead. Remember that. But God who is rich in mercy made you alive. It is not from yourself, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Here's, here's, let me summarize all of those verses to you. We're almost done. Here it is. Our story began dead spiritually, nothing coming in our way, but an encounter with holy and righteous God. Now you are alive. Welcome in God's family. You have been offered love. You have been offered mercy. You have been offered kindness. You have been offered grace. These are all gifts from your heavenly father who loves to give good gifts to his children. That's what happened to you. And then in verse 10, the last verse, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. He saved us for a purpose. It is because of his grace. Your life has been changed. Your life has been transformed and you become everything that God set in motion for you when he saved you to do good works that he prepared in advance for you to do. Now you have new life. Now you have new goals of life, new possibilities. That's all the work of God's grace. But I cannot end my talk here this afternoon without giving you an opportunity. Opportunity to respond to the gospel of the good news of Jesus that I heard in 1976 from a Canadian missionary. There may be some of you this afternoon you have not embraced the gospel personally. I want to give you an opportunity to do just that. You see, 
as I said before, that I heard from this Canadian missionary when I came to know the Lord, when he said that the single most critical decision that a human being need to make during their lifetime here on earth is whether or not that you have been reconciled to the God who loves you. Which means you're not only going to hear and understand it, you have to act on it. You have to make a decision. You have to admit your sin before the God who loves you, which I did in 1976. I asked God to forgive me of my sins. For he paid the price. He became the forgiver. He became the leader of my life. And God created you because he loves you, man. And he wants a personal relationship with you. But because of sin, as the scripture tells us in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. It created this chasm between you and God. That's what sin does. We are separated from God by our sin. And we cannot earn our way back to God because God's standard is perfect. He is holy. And me, I, I can't even measure up. Even if I try. All my efforts fall short, and the result of my effort, the scripture says, the wages, the wages of my sin is death, spiritual and physical death. I am separated, we are separated from the God for all eternity. So I want to give you an opportunity. I'm not going to ask you to stand or come to walk to the front here. But God couldn't stand for the world to end up that way that he built a bridge for us to get to him. And that bridge is the cross. When Jesus died on that cross, he was dying the death that you and I should have. He was paying the moral debt that we cannot pay. So our forgiveness would come not by earning our way, but as a free gift that God gave. That is what grace is. And we can all understand that, as I mentioned before. We can all understand that, but understanding is not enough. We have to cross that bridge. We have to make a choice. That was a challenge given to me in 1976 when I walked that bridge, and you can do the same. And in your heart, as I close, you can pray, you can, just you and God. And you can repeat this prayer after me. There's nothing magical about this prayer. But if this expressed out your heart desire, let's go ahead. And if you do if 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 you if you're gonna pray it, talk to Pastor Mike, talk to the leadership team. They'll be able to help you. Can you please bow your head? And we close our time together with this prayer. It's the prayer that I prayed in 1976. Thank you, God, for loving me. I confess that I am a sinner. Thank you for dying for me on the cross. I ask you to forgive me of my sin and come and be my Lord and Savior in Jesus' name. Amen. Been a privilege to be part of this heritage service that you have got together, Mike, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this. God bless you, and go ahead and enjoy the day. Mm -hmm.